This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. Thank you, and welcome to another episode of Voices in Validation, brought to you by the IVT Network. Managing change is a routine part of doing business in the pharma and biotech industries. Utilizing a risk-based life cycle approach to manufacturing allows us to identify, analyze, understand, manage, and report any risk or potential risk throughout the life cycle. When it comes to change control, it can be much more challenging to apply risk-based methods. Today, we welcome Ivan Soto for a discussion on strategies that enable the implementation of a risk-based change management process. Great to have you with us. Welcome, Ivan. I love Thank having you, you so back much. again. Stacey. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's been a while. Um, yes, it's a it pleasure has. Sure to be here. I'm looking forward to today's discussion. So, to kick us off, Ivan, for the benefit of our listeners, can you define change management and change control as we will be speaking um, about them today? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a number of different definitions out there for both change management and change control. Um, the one I'm going to apply for change management is that this is the collective amount of processes that we have to manage changes in the industry, right? And uh, we have different ways of managing changes. Change control is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, And it's the the process that we need to comply with from a regulatory requirement when we are doing changes to GMP systems that are fully validated. Um, And we also have other methods of managing changes during the life cycle in addition to change control and those include engineering change management and also your work order system as well so in essence we have three different sub processes that uh, we manage on a frequent basis in the industry collectively um, um, that include these three processes. Um, um, and obviously, we typically concentrate on managing a significant amount of our changes under change control. And that's what I was kind of challenging on the article on, on looking at a risk-based approach and relaxing the requirements depending on the risk impact of the change. Sure, sure. So the risk-based approach that we're talking about today um, in in manufacturing is widely accepted in the industry. So we're not trying to say that this is a new concept or anything like that, but what we do still see are companies struggling to apply, um, you know, that risk-based thinking to change control or change management. So why why is that the case, Ivan? Mm -hmm. So I I think that even even risk-based approaches, right, for manufacturing and, and validation, I think the industry is starting to come along up to speed on looking at implementing processes that, that align with that mindset, right? And you see a lot of companies moving towards an ASTM E2500 model. Um, um, uh, the ISP baseline guy was recently updated. Uh, companies are looking at that to align. So there's a little bit of a shift um, um, in a few other processes that we see that the industry is moving towards adopting the risk-based processes, which is a very positive um, 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 a thing that is happening because it has taken way too long. Um, now we change control. Um, um, the, 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 there's still this skepticism and this hesitation to look at change control and say, yeah, we can apply the risk-based um, approaches and philosophies to these uh, by looking at the process a little different, right? Um, um, looking at change classification from a risk perspective, and we don't do that today. A lot of times uh, you have classification for changes that are critical, um, 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 uh, moderate, um, minor, or something similar to that extent. And then when you really look at the definition of each individual Um, um, change level, those definitions normally fail to really be um, risk-based, number one, and truly 
be based on the impact of the change or scope of the change. A lot of times you see change classification definitions that are based on whether the change has a validation activity associated with it, right? And, and that is not defining and classifying the change based on the risk or the scope of the change and the impact of the change. You are classifying changes when you do that based on an activity and an output that, that, that supports the change to enable control of the change, but it's not something that defines the classification of the change as we normally use it in the industry. And that's one of the biggest challenges and flaws that, that we still have um, 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 throughout the industry, the, the change classification themselves. Okay. So I know from your article too, Ivan, that you are a big proponent of um, really having a centralized hub, right, for processing of changes. So can you talk about a little bit about what the advantages are to a centralized processing of changes um, through the quality assurance department as compared to, you know, change control that may be handled by various individuals through uh, a variety of different departments? Mm -hmm. So when it comes down specifically to the change control process, um, um, it's a core um, um, component of the quality management system on the QMS, right? So when you look and dissect the QMS and you look at ownership of the QMS, um, it is very clear that it, it falls under quality, right? They are the keepers of those processes that are the core processes under the QMS. Um, um, and there are many processes that are regulated in under the Code of Federal Regulation or other mechanisms that define our requirements for the industry, but not all of them are components of the core QMS, right? Like kappa deviation, change control, and so on. So therefore, obviously, the, the, the a most appropriate SME to manage the process is, of course, quality, right? right? But then again, there needs to be a partnership and a collaboration in terms of these processes and the interfaces between the quality unit that owns the main process and the other key stakeholders, right? And that collaboration means that instead of dictating how the process is and dictating or maybe sometimes even micromanaging each individual change, is a collaboration among the different functional areas with the intent to control the change. That's all we're trying to do, right? And there are many different mechanisms to do that. Okay, um, 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 so yes, and then when you have a centralized process and approach, you eliminate the inefficiencies that are inherited from having different flavors of that process at different sites, right? Because if you don't have a centralized process driven by an electronic tool, then there are many tools out there that are very efficient to manage this, and some of them are cloud-based. Um, um, what you're going to have is this site per site flavors based on opinions, philosophies, and personalities across the network or a manufacturing network or, or company, right? So that's the reason you want to centralize it, right? And, and you centralize it with a common, potentially global SOP that is a, under a global standard for change control. Um, 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 that is a document that provides you the, 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 the describe you the process on how to enable control of changes throughout the life cycle of systems, right? And, and, and that's the advantages of that. But outside of that, we have other processes to manage changes that are processes that precede the, the, the implementation of the system, that precedes the qualification activities, such as engineering change management, that obviously, fall outside of the control of the um, uh, quality organization that should be centralized under the engineering organization because they are the SMEs, right? right. And these are the change mechanisms that you manage when you are commissioning systems, when you are designing equipment, when you are in the process of qualifying a system as well, 
uh, that you find failures that require a change prior to releasing that system, all that can be managed on the bucket of your engineering change management process, right? And, and, and those two processes look very different. Uh, the, the level of rigor and the level of, of, of oversight is significantly different. And right. the intent to an extent is a little bit different, but just you're still managing and controlling changes, right? Yeah, which totally makes sense. I, I, I'm wondering, you know, we obviously uh, in the lead in, we said that uh, there's still a lot of businesses or organizations out there that are struggling to, um, act, you know, implement risk based approaches to change management. And uh, uh, in follow up to that, I'm wondering where the challenges are. And, and you just listed, you know, um, processes, adoption of tools. Uh, I'm wondering if management or not knowing who the manager is, where do you think the biggest challenges lie then in actually implementing um, this approach or this change management approach um, across the industry? Any so, thoughts so on that? So, yeah, so I, I think the, 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 the challenges come from mostly the hesitation to move to a risk-based approach away from the traditional process. There's a false perception that the more stringent my change control process is, the better I manage my changes and control them. But the, the fact of the matter is that history has proven that that's not true, right? Um, um, because if your changes are not classified correctly. Um, if your change, class, change classifications are not adequate, um, 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 more control and more oversight doesn't yield better results. What yield better results is to have a good process, right? right? And a good process requires adequate tools to be able to manage that process. So, so one of the biggest challenges here is that we fail sometimes to look at change classification from a risk perspective, right? So if I go in and say, you know, I look at my risk classifications and I say, I have a definition for my highest category, critical changes. And critical changes are changes that are high risk, that have high risk impact to um, the, the, the product, the, the process, the patient, uh, da -di -da -di -da. and then you develop risk assessment tools, simple tools, one page, five questions that you embed in the change control process, okay? Each score, each answer has a score based on whether the answer is on the higher end of the risk or the lower end, and you score it appropriately per question and then you do a risk score at the end now you have a range okay right. or, or, a, or a risk priority number that gives you a mathematical value or assessment of risk of that change and then based on that you could say okay this is a high risk change because it falls under this bucket with my risk priority number and it is in the higher end right and this is a medium risk change because based on our assessment of risk impact of this change, then I assess that is medium or low risk. Guess what happened? Now your path and process for those different categories of changes that are based on risk should be different. Right. Because now you understand to the right is my bucket of high risk changes that I do. That when and I assess them- prioritize the higher risk, the higher the risk, the higher the priority, right? Exactly, and the yeah. level of rigor and oversight and how I manage that change, right? Exactly. Because then you could come to a point that the, the first step that you do on the change process is your change classification and your risk assessment of the change. That defines the path. So if yeah. it's high risk, I do a change control and potentially entertain the idea that if they are medium or low risk, you do a work order. And then most companies have work order systems that are similar to their change control process already with QA oversight. So why having two records when I can have one for 
this bucket of changes on the medium and low risk and have change control for the higher risk end of the changes. Exactly. So in follow up to that, I mean, you've talked about engineering change management and now you just mentioned work order management uh, and change control together. I want you to talk a little bit about what the difference is between those, but really, you know, do we need all of these different change management processes uh, in support of the product and system lifecycle? So can you talk about uh, first, whether we need, you know, all of them, uh, how many we do need, and really what is the difference then um, between engineering change management and the work order management and change control that you just mentioned in terms of your processes as an organization? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, the, to answer the, the first question, they are needed, right? Because um, they provide tools and mechanisms to meet the premise in the legal requirement that we have on the regulation that we must control changes throughout the life cycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, 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 but what the regulation doesn't say is that you must manage every change with the most stringent conservative control under a change control process that is overly conservative and very stringent, right? And very restrictive. So with that said, right, they are needed. Um, 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 and they are needed depending on, and, and they should be implemented and used based on the level of risk of the change, right? So if I look at these three buckets, right? Change, change management and engineering change management early on the life cycle, that's your mechanism to manage changes prior to implementing that GMP asset and completing the validation, right? right? Now, when you get to, so all the way through, and as ASTM suggests, all the way from design through the completion of your OQ, you, you should be working with engineering change management. Yes, you have a change control to implement that piece of equipment or system, absolutely yes. but Changes that are happening as I'm managing the life cycle, whether it's design changes or automation changes that I need to do as I start doing engineering runs with that piece of equipment and doing shakedown runs and so on, I'm learning about the equipment on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, um, and now I am doing changes documenting those changes on my engineering change management process with the support of the appropriate SMEs, which are engineering, validation, and the system owner, right? All those changes are managed. We test all these changes throughout the life cycle stages over here. And then obviously we come to completion of commissioning. We move to OQ. A lot of times you have a lot of change management items that you couldn't close when you complete commissioning. So those move to your IOQ. You need to test those before you release the piece of equipment because you did changes that you never tested. And now you complete your IOQ, you complete your qualification, now you move into PQ. Now we move into change control, right? And at that point, when you move into a GMP release of that piece of equipment, that's when you come in and you have quality oversight for that piece of equipment because the risk increases. Now you're going to start making product with that piece of equipment. Before you were doing qualification activity commissioning, developing and designing the equipment, which is far away from making product. So that's where the risk-based approach come in play as it relates to change is how close you are to the product. And even when you are making product with, those, with that piece of equipment is what is the risk of my change? And if my risk is low, maybe I could manage it on my work order system in maximum, right? And describe what I'm going to do for enabling the change and provide you know, the statements that quality wants on that record. But that record, that work order record has a life cycle that is much shorter than the change control for the high risk system. And then guess what happened? The shorter the life cycle, the quicker you do implementations, the quicker you enable an asset that is not depreciating on the warehouse. So it's really dependent on the, uh, the different stages, right? Uh, absolutely. It, it, it absolutely, totally dependent on the different stages of the life cycle, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
can you talk a little bit more about the different stages of the life cycle? Give us an example of, you know, um, how you would utilize uh, these different, you know, engineering versus, uh, uh, you know, engineering controls versus um, uh, the, the change order. Yep, yep. Dependent so, on, so you know, life cycle dependent, like, so depending on which cycle we're in. So, talk a little bit about first what the various yep. stages are, and then you can say how you so would. Apply. Yep, but absolutely. So, early on the life cycle of any equipment or system, uh, your mechanism for mechanism for managing changes is your engineering change management, right? right. Uh, no quality oversight, you have a simple process, you document the, the description of the change, um, you do a technical assessment, uh, maybe a validation assessment, the system owner review it, engineering review it, we move forward, and maybe even validation review. If you review that, the change gets done, and you have a uh, traceability of everything you did early on the life cycle and you have it documented as well, right? Because the intent over here is to make sure that any change that I do early on the life cycle, I have some type of documentation for that change. And then at the same time that I come in and test the change prior to releasing the equipment to make sure that that change works. Now, the work order process is used throughout the two stages, right? Because there will be work orders that will be generated to generate work that is associated with the early stages of the life cycle in support of an engineering change management record, right? Yeah. And a work order may say, calibrate that bioreactor or uh, passivate that new piece of equipment. And all those records are part of the life cycle. Now, when we move and we complete qualification and we move into the GMP operational stage of the system, we under change control, no, no argument over there, right? right? And we're gonna have quality oversight and we are going to have work orders too that we are going to create to manage some of those change controls that we are creating for that piece of equipment. Now, my point on the article is not everything needs to be a change control on the operational phase. Be smart. Right. And if you go and have you change classifications based on risk, you only do a change control record for high risk changes. Sure. And then everything else during the operational stage, you manage under a work order, right? Okay. Because this has a much more efficient cycle time, is less stringent. The impact of this bucket of changes is much lower from a risk perspective. Therefore, they don't need to be managed with the stringent process over here. Now you have um, um, uh, two very similar processes that are managing the changes based on risk. Today, in a lot of places or most companies, what they do is they have a change control record, they have a work order. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that work order is a mirror or you change control record. It's just a duplicate. When you look at the two records together, they look the same. So, but really what we are differentiating, which is important for everyone to know is the risk score, right? You have to have obviously done that piece of work um, in order to really um, move through the implementation of, of um, these processes. So, but, so I totally understand how, you know, you need to uh, do your due diligence, develop your risk score based on your tools. Um, and then of course that risk score helps you to figure out which next steps you need to take for implementation. Um, but I'm hoping you can talk a little bit more about the tools you use here mm -hmm. um, and uh, for the benefit of our listeners and, um, you know, how you use those to really accurately develop your risks. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you want to have a change risk assessment tool that is simple, is short, and that is concise on assessing the risk of your changes, right? So, what you want to do with these tools is very similar to any uh, risk assessment tool. You want to have a series of questions on the tool 
And you want to have buckets or categories so different areas of risk that you are assessing when you are assessing that specific change that is coming to you, right? And that change is going to have a description. We are going to change the dissolve oxygen um, 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 uh, control strategy for the bioreactor. Um, and we are going to increase the amount of oxygen uh, concentration in the bioreactor by a factor of X, da, 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 da. you assess that with that tool. The tool is going to look at a different number of different categories of risk, right? And one of them you always want to do is to look at the uh, impact to quality of the product, right? Right, of course. Um, as one of the as one of the categories, right? And and that you want to see whether any issues with the change itself or the nature of the change can have impact on product quality. So in the example of the changing the dissolved oxygen mm -hmm. um, um, strategy on a bioreactor on an upstream operation, you know the risk to product quality is potentially lower than in a downstream operation change. Um, and you should score it appropriately based on how far are you from your finished product, right? And right. you're going to have questions related to that category of risk that you're assessing. And you're going to, you go, you, you, you want to go with a very simple yes and no answer approach with check boxes, right? And then Typically, the answers that are scored as a yes are in the higher risk of the of, of, of the high, higher end of the risk as it relates to change. And then you want to assign a score a category to that yes answer. And ideally, you want to be very um, 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 even on the distribution of, of how you do this because otherwise you you're going to go very biased on right. the higher end of the risk as well. So, you know, you could normally assign a value of you know, maybe a six, and then your nose are a three. Now your distribution between one answer and the other is half, right? And then you build the different risk answers based on the type of change. And then you look at different buckets. You look at the, the impact to, to the product itself, right? Um, um, the impact to the critical quality attributes the impact to patient safety that could happen as a, re, as a result of that change. Um, 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 you look at the impact to the stability of the product with the change. So right? all of these questions, Ivan, then are obviously part, they're part of your processes, part of your procedures uh, well ahead of time. And the yes, no piece uh, obviously must be set up so that doesn't matter who's answering the questions to eliminate, as you mentioned, the biases here, you want the questions yes. to be um, general enough, or I guess a part of so much part of the process that really, no matter who in your team is doing, you know, this checklist, they're going to answer the same way as if somebody else was doing it. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. you want objectivity in right. the process, right? In right. terms exactly. of the assessment of risk. Uh, and, 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 and to make it objective, the, the questions need to be concise and very clear and to the bucket or category that you're assessing the risk. The other critical piece to this is also the risk scoring as well and the, the, the ranges that you have for the different buckets on the low, medium, and high risk, right? Uh, and you want to be careful when you develop these tools, whether it's for a change control or process or for assessing as, uh, the risk impact of a system, because it, the, it, you make the, the range of the re low risk too narrow and the range of the medium narrow as well, and much broader on the, on the, on the range, risk range for value for the high, you are pushing everything to the high, higher end of the risk mm -hmm. as it relates to that change. And that distribution on the risk scores need to be um, um, an equal distribution. So if my low risk is a range of, that has a distribution of a factor of six, right? 
And for lack of a better example, let's say that we say that the lower risk values are 23 to 29, right? Then I should be looking at my medium risk, right? Yeah. From 29 and above by a factor of what? Of six, right? And then similarly, when you get to the higher end of the risk is then, okay, that higher value of the medium and above is my higher end of the risk. You're not forcing and you're not being biased when you do it that way. A lot of times we design these tools and we make the range of the high risk value so broader, much broader than the other two categories. And then we pushing everything to the high risk and other risk. And that is not objective. Right, right. So Ivan, I want to follow that up with so that I can learn a little bit more about the risk assessment versus the impact assessment um, that you mentioned. You know, changes typically include an impact assessment as part of the change control system. Um, but I, I understand that an impact assessment may not be as comprehensive as a risk assessment. And I'm just wondering if you can, I guess, speak to the similarities and differences here, but does this have anything to do with your um, risk, your your risk uh, priority? Which one of these tools you use, or do you always apply the impact assessment and the risk assessment? So I, I would I say that in, in in a world where you go to a risk based approach or change classifications um, and change the definitions. Uh, you 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 integrate your impact assessment with your risk assessment okay. for the change, and they all become one, right? Yeah. Because that that risk that and and then you you, you do your risk, you change risk impact assessment, mm -hmm. um, uh, because that is a lot a lot much more objective when well defined, and when you have adequate tools to assess the risk impact of that change, right? And, and that's what we were talking earlier about having a tool that doesn't exceed two pages, uh, that doesn't exceed more than 10 questions, uh, that the questions are very clear and concise in terms of assessing the risk of the change. And then simply that you look at the buckets or categories of risk that are well documented in every single industry standards as it relates to risk. And, you know, we talked about those earlier, the impact to the product quality, right, the right, impact right, to right. the product itself, the impact to the patient, the impact to the process, the impact to contamination control, sterility, sterility and cleanability of that equipment as well. Those things will tell you the, 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 the risk impact of that change when you are looking at those buckets or categories. And I think it, it's an adequate, a better way of doing change because now you introduce the aspect of understanding the risk impact of the change that we normally don't understand today because we don't have that built thing into the process. So it's something that um, in an ideal uh, situation is they're one and the same because they're both happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both yep. happening. And they both giving you, they both giving, they both giving you a picture when they are integrated of what, what, what is the, what, what is the impact of your change, right? And, and you want to integrate it because impact translates to risk. Well, right, it seems to me and that now you want important, but I just didn't know if there were times when you just did an impact assessment and didn't do the full risk assessment. But it sounds mm -hmm. like you do mm -hmm. the entire thing every each time. Yeah, that's a recommendation on the article, absolutely. Yeah, so Ivan, how can these change control systems provide the evidence then uh, of, of compliance? for our regulators? You know, when the regulatory authorities come in, what specifically are they looking for? Well, what we want to do is that we want to have adequate procedures to manage a process like this, right? Um, you're going to have a change control procedure and, and that procedure should be a document that walks you through the process so and requirements so managing changes and creating a change. And, you know, we want to always have a global standard for change control as well. So regulators are looking for whether you have a, um, um, a process that is on a state of control or not, 
okay? Regulators are gonna come in and look at a list of, of changes that you've done through since the last inspection. And typically it's a biannual inspection. So they're gonna look at all the changes you did throughout the two year period. And as we know, when that inspector comes through the door, the next request he has on the on, on his on his on his on lab is asking you for all the deviations that happened the last two years, right? And the, and all the corrective actions that you did in the last two years. So from there, they start digging in into the into your ability of, of, of being in a state of control, right? So right. what regulators are looking for, they're gonna say, okay, give me your changes. Give me your deviation, give me your corrective actions. So if they start seeing a pattern that you're doing changes and changes and changes to a piece of equipment, you start seeing deviations within the same time period after the change is implemented. And then you do all these corrective actions, but you come back to do a deviation again because you still have an issue with that piece of equipment that requires another change and you never get out of that loop. The, 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 the regulator is going to see you don't have a state of control. And a lot of times is because you have an inadequate process for managing changes and inadequate process for doing root cause analysis on your deviations that yields inadequate corrective actions that don't permanently correct the problem, right? right. So, so, so the regulators are gonna be looking at that. And this is where a risk-based change control process provides you a more accurate and objective picture of the impact of that change, right? And then you enables you to manage changes adequately based on the level of risk. And then in that way, you put your effort and resources on the high risk changes and the, and, and the con stringent controls as well. One of the issues today is that because we manage everything on the same bucket, and we also limited in resources. You know, now you you are managing a low risk change with all these controls on top of it that slows down that change that might be critical and not that much of an impact at all. Right. But at the same time, it takes away resources from what is critical. Right. It takes away resources from a high risk change that needs all those controls and then shift them away from the lower end of the risk. So, so it, that's not a smart way of working in this industry because what you're doing is sacrificing the level of control and quality that you need on the higher end of the risk by applying it on the lower end, right? And and in, in there, you, you know, potentially neglecting and, over, and, and, and overlooking something that is critical for this change that you don't see initially because you don't understand the risk impact of that change. Right, right. So obviously this risk-based approach helps you to work more efficiently and stay in control, which means less changes overall, right? So there's less for regulators to look at when they do come in. Less changes, less deviations, right. um, um, better control um, um, as well, um, and, and then and then and then and then shifting the 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 attention to the high risk changes, right? Right. And then and because you know you 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 always gonna have change control. You always gonna have change. Equipment breaks. Um, we need we need new equipment. Uh, we have a DI initiative that require changes to equipment or new equipment. Uh, we, we change is something that we never get away from in the industry. We are in a extremely sure. dynamic industry. I think the critical piece to this is that, that, that we manage changes and that we are efficient and successful in doing that. And, and, and by me, meaning that we don't create problems from doing changes, right? That we don't create deviations that geo more cost because we are not managing our changes adequately because we don't have a risk-based process. We don't have an adequate right. process. And, 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 and that's what you want to do because you're always gonna have a high population of changes. But what you want to do is to control them in, in an adequate way because what you want to prevent is 
problems after changes. And it happens a lot. You implement a change with the intent to fix something and you have a problem. You implement a new piece of equipment because you think you have the best piece of equipment to resolve a problem or a uni operation and you didn't do your homework when you buy that piece of equipment and now it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. You have a problem. So the intent here is to control changes, truly control changes, but doing it down on a risk-based approach. Very good. Well, Ivan, thanks for taking some time today uh, to talk about this subject and uh, really elaborate on the article that you wrote on the same topic, which we will share uh, in the show notes for our listeners so they can take a look at that and use the two together. Um, before we wrap up today, I just want to see if there's any last thoughts or ideas you'd like to leave our listeners with. Uh, the article is very clear on the my message to, to the industry and the readers about looking at change control a little different, um, looking at a risk-based approach to looking at engineering change management and using it adequately as suggested on industry standards and in the appropriate stages of the life cycle. Um, um, I think we don't need a change, con a super conservative change control process for every change because not every change carries the same level of risk. Okay, not all changes are created equal. There's, there's not a one size fits all um, a change. Um, 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 um. And, there's, and, and that is the reason that I highly suggest to people and, and the, the audience that they consider implementing a, a risk-based approach to change control and change management, that they look at developing tools that even before you go in and get into the business of opening a change, you do a, risk um, a change risk impact assessment and that determines your path forward whether you do a change control or simply a work order for that change moving forward and then then you look at the two at the two processes and obviously i suggest that as you're going to potentially look at using the work order process as your as um, 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 process for managing medium and low risk changes that obviously you ensure that there's quality oversight on the work order process because it's required from a predicate rule requirement in the in the regulations. So you and most companies have it today. That's the reason that you want to take advantage of, of a risk-based approach because in that way you could channel some changes through the work, more simple work order process and then these high risk changes to your change control process that is a lot more stringent, that requires a lot more controls because it's higher risk. And then this provides a, a, a more efficient, um, 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 pragmatic way of managing your changes because if we go by the premise that not all changes are created equal, that not all changes carry the same level of risk, then that Lead, lead us to the logical mindset of saying, I don't need to manage all of them the same way. Right, right. And you definitely have to uh, rely on your prioritized, you know, by risk, on your priorities based on risk. And, and that Absolutely. is, um, the, I think, the number one takeaway from uh, this episode and from the article. So thank you, Ivan Soto, for being our guest today. It's great to have you again. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. I also care. want to give a shout out to our producer, Ben Kitchen. And most importantly, I'm sending out thanks to you, our valued listeners. I appreciate your time each week, as well as your help in sharing this podcast. Together, we'll continue to spread the word. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to subscribe in your podcast player of choice. And of course, be sure to share it with your friends, colleagues, and online networks so they can enjoy it too. Plus, send us a quick note or leave an online review if you're so inclined. We'd love to include your feedback with our, with our networks. For show notes, including links to Ivan's article and additional podcast resources, please visit www.ivtnetwork.com. We'll be back again next week with another fun and insightful discussion. Until then, make it a great week.